Hey y'all, so the book I'm going to be reading is Ceremony by Leslie uh, Marmon Silco. And this is a book that I have to read for my Native American literature class. So, the first chapter is Sunrise, and it says, and it reads, Tayo didn't sleep well that night. He tossed in the old iron bed and the coiled springs kept squeaking even after he lay still again, calling up humid dreams of black night and loud voices rolling him over and over again like debris caught in a flood. Tonight, the singing had come first, squeaking out of the iron bed, a man singing in Spanish, the melody of a familiar love song, two words again and again, e Volvere. Sometimes the Japanese voices came first, angry and loud, pushing the song far away, and then he could hear the shift in his dreaming, like a slight afternoon wind changing its direction, coming less and less from the south, moving into the west, and the voices would be, the voices would become Laguna voices, and he could hear Uncle Josiah call, calling to him. Josiah bringing him the fever medicine when he had been sick a long time ago. But before Josiah could come, the fever voices would drift and whirl and emerge again. Japanese soldiers shouting orders to him, suffocating damp voices that drifted out in the jungle seam, and he heard the women's voices then. They faded in and out until he was frantic because he thought the Laguna words were his mother's. But when he was about to make out the meaning of the words, the voice suddenly broke into a language he could not understand. And it was then that all the voices were drowned by the music. Loud, loud music from a big jukebox. It's flashing red and blue lights, pulling the darkness closer. He lay there early in the morning and watched the high, small window above the bed. Dark gray gradually became lighter until it cast a white square on the opposite wall at dawn. He watched the room grow brighter then, at the square of light, as the square of light grew steadily warm warmer, more yellow than the climbing sun. He had not been able to sleep for a long time, for as long as all things had become tied together like colts in single file when he and Josiah had taken them to the mountain, with the halter rope of one's colt, of one colt tied to the tail of the colt ahead of it, and the lead colt's rope tied to the wide horn on Josiah's Mexican saddle. He could still see them now, the creamy sorrel, the bright red bay, and the gray roan their slick summer coats reflecting the sunlight as it came up from behind the yellow mesas. Mesas, shining on them, strung out behind Josiah's horse like an old time pack train. He could get no rest as long as the memories were tangled with the present, tangled up like colored threads from old grandma's wicker sewing basket when he was a child. And he had carried them outside to play and they had spilled out of his arms into the summer weeds and rolled away in all directions. And then he had hurried to pick them up before, before Auntie had found them. He could feel it inside his skull, the tension of little threads being pulled and how it was with tangled things, things tied together. And as he tried to pull them apart and rewind them into their places, they snagged and tangled even more. So Tayo had to sweat through those nights when thoughts became entangled. He had to sweat to think of something that wasn't unraveled or tied in knots to the past something that existed by itself, itself, standing alone like a deer. And if he could hold that image of the deer in his mind long enough, his stomach might shiver less and let him sleep for a while. It worked as long as the deer was alone, as long as he could keep it a gray buck on an unrecognized hill. But if he did not hold it tight, it would spin away from him and become the deer he and Rocky had hunted. That memory would unwind in, into the last day when they had sat together oiling their rifles in the jungle of some nameless Pacific island. While they used up the last of the oil in Rocky's pack, they talked about the deer that Rocky had hunted, and the corporal next to them shook his head and kept saying he had dreamed the Japs would get them that day. The, the humid air turned into sweat that had run down the corporal, corporal's face while he, while he had repeated that, repeated his dream to them. That was the first time Tayo had realized that the man's skin was not much different from his own. The skin. 
He saw the skin of the corpses again and again in ditches on either side of the long, muddy road. Skin that was stretched, stretched shiny and dark over bloated hands. Even white men were darker after death. There was no difference when they were swollen and covered with flies. That had become the worst thing for Tayo. They looked too familiar even when they were alive. When the sergeant told him to kill all the Japanese soldiers lined up in front of the cave with their hands on their heads, Tayo could not pull the trigger. The fever made him shiver and the sweat was stinging his eyes and he couldn't see clearly. In that instant, he saw Josiah standing there. The face was dark from the sun and the eyes were squinting as though he were about to smile at Tayo. So Tayo stood there, stiff with nausea, while they fired at the soldiers, and he watched his uncle fall, and he knew it was Josiah. And even after Rocky started shaking him by the soldiers and telling him to stop crying, it was still Josiah lying there. They forced medicine into Tayo's mouth, and Rocky pushed him toward the corpses and told him to look. Look past the blood that was already dark like the jungle mud, with only flecks of bright red still shimmering in it. Rocky made him look at the corpse and said, Tayo, this is a Jap. It was Josiah, eyes shrinking back into the skull and all their shining black, black light glazed over by death. Hey, Tanya. The sergeant had called for a medic and somebody rolled up Tayo's sleeve. They told him to sleep and the next day they all acted as though nothing had happened. They called it battle fatigue and they said hallucinations were common with malarial fever. Rocky had reasoned it out with him. It was impossible for the dead man to be Josiah because Josiah was an old Laguna man, thousands of miles from the Philippine jungles and Japanese armies. He's probably up on some mesa right now, chopping wood, Rocky said. He smiled and shook Tayo's shoulders. Hey, I know you're homesick, but Tayo, we're supposed to be here. This is what we're supposed to do. Tayo nodded, slapped at the insects mechanically and staring straight ahead past the smothering dampness of the green jungle leaves. He examined the facts and logic again and again, the way Rocky had explained it to him. The facts made what he had seen an impossibility. He felt the shivering then. It began at the tips of his fingers and pulsed into his arms. He shivered because all the facts, all the reasons made no difference anymore. He could hear Rocky's words and he could, feel the, he could follow the logic of what Rocky said. And he could not feel anything except a swelling in his belly, a great swollen grief that was pushing into his throat. He had to keep busy. He had to keep moving so that the sinews connected behind his eyes did not slip loose and spin his eyes to the interior of his skull where the scenes waited for him. He got out of the bed quickly where, while, he, while he could still see the square of yellow sunshine on the wall opposite the bed and he pulled on his jeans and the scuffed brown boots he had worn before the war, and the red plaid western shirt old grandma gave him the day he had come home after the war. The air outside was still cold. The air outside was still cool. It smelled like night dampness, faintly of rain. He washed his face in the still cold water of the iron trough by the windmill. The yellow striped cap purred and wrapped herself around his legs while he combed his hair. She ran ahead of him to the goat pen and shoved her head under his left arm when he knelt down to milk the black goat. He poured milk for her in the liquid of an old enamel coffee pot, and then he opened the pen and let them run, greedy for the tender green shoots of tumbleweeds pushing through the sand. The kid was almost too big to nurse anymore, and it knelt by the dough and punched down to reach the tits, butting her to make the milk come faster wiggling its tail violently until the nanny jumped away and turned on the kid, butting it away from her. The process of weaning had gone on like this for weeks, but the nanny was more intent on weeds than the lesson. And when Tayo left them, the kid goat was back at the tits, a little more careful this time. The sun was climbing then, and it looked like, and it looked small in that empty morning sky. He knew he should eat, but he wasn't hungry anymore. He sat down in the kitchen at the small square table with the remains of a white candle melted to a nub on the lid of a coffee can. He wondered how long the candle had been there. He wondered if Josiah had been the one to light it last. He thought he would cry then, thinking of Josiah and how he'd been here and touched all of these things. Sat in this chair. So he jerked his head away from the candle and looked at the suit around the base of the coffee pot. 
He wouldn't waste firewood to heat up yesterday's coffee, or maybe it was the day before yesterday's coffee. He had lost track of the days there. The drought years had returned again, as they had after the First World War and in the 20s, when he was a child and they had to haul water to the sheep in big wooden barrels in the old wagon. The windmill near the sheep camp had gone dry, so the gray mules pulled the wagon from the springs, moving slowly so that the water would not splash over the rims. He sat close to his uncle then and on the wagon seat, above the bony gray rumps of the mules. After they had dumped water for the sheep, they went to burn the spines from the chola and prickly pear. They stood back to back by the wagon and watched the cows walk up to the cactus cautiously, sneezing at the smoldering ashes. The cows were patient while the scorched green pulp cooled, and then they thought and then they brought out their wide spotted tongues and ate those strange remains because the hills were bare in those years and only the cactus could grow. Now there was no wagon or wooden barrels. One of the gray mules had eaten a poison weed near a coma and the other one was blind. It stayed close to the windmill at the ranch, grazing on the yellow rice grass that grew in the blow sand. It walked a skinny trail, winding in blind circles from the grass to the water trough, where it dipped its mouth in the water and let the water dribble out again. Rinsing its mouth four or five times a day to make sure the water was still there. The dry air shrank the wooden staves of the barrels. They pulled loose, and now the rusty steel hoops were scattered on the ground behind the coral in the crazy patterns of some flashy Kiawa hoop dancer at the gallop ceremonials, throwing his hoops along the ground where he would hook and flip them into the air again, and they would skim over his head and shoulders down to his dancing feet like magic. Tayo stepped inside one that was half buried in the reddish blue sand. He hooked an edge with the toe of his boot, and then he let it slip into the sand again. The wind had blown since late February, and it did not stop after April. They said it had been that way for six years. Well, for the past six years. While he was gone. And all this time, they had watched the sky expectantly for the rain clouds to come. Now it was late May, and when Tayo went to the outhouse, he left the door wide open, facing the dry, empty hills and the light blue sky. He watched the sky over the distant black mountains the way Josiah had many years before, because sometimes when the rain finally came, it was from the southwest. Jungle rain had no beginning or end. It grew like foliage from the sky, branching and arching to the earth, sometimes in solid thickets entangling the islands and or other times in tendrils of blue mist curling out of coastal clouds. The jungle breathed an eternal green that fevered men until they dripped sweat the way rubbery jungle leaves dripped the monsoon rain. It was there that Tayo began to understand what Josiah had said. Nothing was all good or, b or all bad either. It all depended. Jungle rain lie suspended in the air, choking their lungs as they marched. It soaked into their boots until their skin on their toes pulled away dead and wounds turned green. This was not the rain he, had, he and Josiah had prayed for, this was not the green foliage they saw out in sandy canyons as a sign of spring. When Tayo prayed on the long muddy road to the prison camp, it was for dry air. Dry as a hundred years squeezed out of yellow sand air, to dry out the oozing wounds of Rocky's leg, to let the torn flesh and broken bones breathe, to clear the sweat that filled Rocky's eyes. It was that rain which filled the tire ruts and made the mud so deep that the corporal Corporal began to slip and fall with this end of the muddy blanket that held Rocky. Tayo hated this unending rain as if it were the jungle green rain and not the miles of marching or the Japanese grenade that was killing Rocky. He would blame the rain if the Japs saw how the corpor corporal staggered, if they saw how weak Rocky had become, and came to crush his head with the butt of a rifle. Then it would be the rain and the green all around that killed him. Tayo walked to the corporal almost incessantly, walking behind him with his end of the blanket stretcher, telling him that it wasn't much farther now and all downhill from there. He made a story for all of them, a story to give them strength. The words of the story poured out of his mouth as if they had substance. Pebbles and stone extending to, the, to hold the corporal up, to keep his knees from buckling, to keep his hands from letting go of the blanket. The sound of the rain got louder, pounding on the leaves, splashing into the ruts, 
It splattered on his head and the sound echoed inside his skull. It steamed down his face and neck like jungle flies with crawling feet. He wanted to turn loose the blanket to wipe the rain away. He wanted to let go for only a moment, but as long as the corporal was still standing, still moving, they had to keep going. Then from somewhere within the sound of the rain falling, he could hear it approaching like a summer flash flood. The rumble still faint and distant, flood water boiling down a narrow canyon. He could smell the foaming flood water, stagnant and ripe with the rotting debris it carried past each village, sucking up their sewage, their waste, the dead animals who tried to hold it back, but the wind swept down from the green coastal mountains, whipping the rain into gray waves that blinded him. The corporal fell, jerking the ends of the blanket from his hands, and he felt Rocky's foot brush past his own leg. He slid to his knees, trying to fight the ends of the blanket again, and he started repeating a word I will never say. It flooded out of the last warm core in his chest and echoed inside his head. He dammed the rain until the words were a chant, and he sang it while he crawled through the mud to find the corporal and get him up before the Japanese saw them. He wanted the words to make a cloudless blue sky, pale with the summer, summer sun pressing across wide and empty horizons. The word gathered inside him and gave him strength. He pulled on the corporal's arm. He lifted him to his knees, and all the time he could hear his own voice praying against the rain. It was summertime, and Ikthoa Goya Reed woman was always taking a bath. She spent all day long sitting in the river, splashing down the summer rain. But her sister, Corn Woman, worked hard all day, sweating in the sun, getting sore hands in the cornfield. Corn Woman got tired of that. She got angry. She scolded her sister for bathing all day long. Iktoa Ak Oya Reed Woman went away then. She went back to the original place down below. Leviticus. And there was no more rain then. Everything dried up. All the plants, the corn, the beans, they all dried up and started blowing away in the winds. The people and the animals were thirsty. They were starving. So he had prayed the rain away and for the sixth year it was dry. The grass turned yellow and it did not grow. Wherever he looked, Tayo could see the, con the consequences of his praying. The gray mule grew gaunt and the goat and kid had to wander farther and farther each day to find weeds or dry shrubs to eat. Shrubs to eat. In the evenings, they waited for him, chewing their cuds by the shed door and the mule stood by the gate with blind marble eyes. He threw them a little dusty hay and sprinkled some cracked corn over it. The nanny crowded the kid away from the corn. The mule whinnied and leaned against the sagging gate. Tayo reached into the coffee can and he held some corn under the quivering lips. When the corn was gone, the mule looked for the salt taste on his hand. The tongue was rough and wet, but it was also warm and precise across his fingers. Tayo looked at the long white hairs growing out of the lips like antennas, and he got the choking in his throat again. And he cried for all of them and for what he had done. For a long time, he had been white smoke. He did not realize that until he left the hospital because white smoke had no consciousness of itself, it faded into the, into the white world of their bed sheets and walls. It was sucked away by the words of doctors who tried to talk to the invisible scattered smoke. He had seen outlines of gray steel, steel tables, outlines of the food they pushed into his mouth which was only an outline too, like all the outlines he saw. They saw his outline, but they did not realize it was hollow inside. He walked down floors that smelled of old wax and disinfectant, watching the outlines of his feet as he walked. The days and seasons, dis seasons disappeared into a twilight at the corner of his eyes, a twilight he could only catch with a sudden motion, jerking his head to one side for a glimpse of green leaves pressed against the bars on the window. He in habit inhabited a gray winter fog on a distant elk mountain where hunters are lost indefinitely and their own bones mark their boundaries. He stood outside the train de stripe. He stood outside the train depot in Los Angeles and felt the sunshine. He saw palm trees, the edges of their branches turning yellow, dead gray fronds scaling off, scattered over the ground, and at that moment, his body had density again, 
and the world was visible and he realized why he was there and he remembered Rocky and he started to cry. The red Spanish tile on the depot on the depot roof got blurry and he did not move or wipe away the tears because it had been a long time since he had cried for anyone. The smoke had been dense. Visions and memories of the past did not penetrate there and he had only and he had drifted in colors of smoke where there was no paint, only pale pale gray of the north wall by his bed. Their medicine drained memory out of his thin arms and replaced it with a twilight cloud behind his eyes. It was not possible to cry in the remote and foggy mountain. If they had not dressed him and led him to the car, he would still be there drifting along the north wall, invisible in the gray twilight. The new doctor asked him if he had ever been visible, and Taya spoke to him softly and said that he was sorry, but nobody was allowed to speak to an invisible one. But the new doctor persisted. He came each day, and his questions dissolved the edges of the fog, and his voice sounded louder and louder every time he came. The sun was dissolving the fog, and one day Taya heard a voice answering the doctor. The voice was saying, he can't talk to you. He is invisible. His words are formed with an invisible tongue. They have no sound. He reached into his mouth and felt his own tongue. It was dry and dead, the carcass of a tiny rodent. It is easy to remain invisible here, isn't it, Tayo? It was until you came. It was all white, all the color of the smoke and the fog. I am sending you home, Tayo. Tomorrow, you'll go on the train. He can't go, he cries all the time. Sometimes he vomits when he cries. Why does he cry, Tayo? He cries because they are dead and everything is dying. He could see the doctor clearly then the dark, thick hair growing on the backs of the doctor's hands as they reached out at him. Go ahead, Tayo, you can cry. He wanted to scream at the doctor then, but the words choked him and he coughed up his own tears and tasted their salt in his mouth. He smelled the disinfectant then, the urine and the vomit, and he gagged. He raised his head from the sink in the corner of the room. He gripped both sides and he looked up at the doctor. Can't say this word. He said softly, look what you have done. There was a cardboard name tag on the handle of the suitcase he carried. He could fill it with the tips of his fingers. His name was on the tag and his serial number too. It had been a long time since he had thought about having a name. The man at the ticket window told him it would be 25 minutes before the train left on track four. He pointed out the big doors to the tracks and told Tayo he could wait out there. Tayo felt weak and the longer he walked, the more his legs felt as though they might become invisible again. Then the top part of his body would topple, and when his head was level with the ground, he would be lost in the smoke again, in the fog again. He breathed the air outside the doors, and it smelled like trains, diesel oil, and creosite, creosite ties under the steel track. He leaned against the de depot wall then. He was sweating, and sounds were becoming outlines again vague and hollow in his ears and he knew he was going to become invisible right there. It was too late to ask for help and he waited to die the way smoke dies, drifting away in currents of air, twisting in thin swirls, fading until it exists no more. His last thought was how generous they had become, sending him to the LA depot alone, finally allowing him to die. He lay on the concrete listening to the voices that surrounded him, voices that were either soft or distant. They spoke to him in English, and when he did not answer, there was a discussion, and he heard the Japanese words vividly. He wasn't sure where he was anymore. Maybe back in the jungles again? He felt a sweat shiver over him like the shadow of the angel Auntie talked about. He fought to come to the surface, and he expected a rifle barrel to be shoved into his face when he opened his eyes. It was all worse than he had ever dreamed, to have drifted all those months in white smoke, only to wake up again in the prison camp. But he did not want to be invisible when he died, so he pulled himself loose. One last time. The Japanese, wo the Japanese women were holding small children by the hands, and they were surrounded by bundles and suitcases. One of them was standing over. Are you, are you sick, she asked. He 
tried to answer her, but his throat made a, <laughs> a coughing, gagging sound. He looked at her and tried to focus in on the others. We called for help, she said, bending over slightly. The hem of her flower print dress swaying below her knees. A white man in a train uniform came. He looked at Tayo, and then he looked at the women and children. What happened to him? They shook their heads, and the woman said, We saw him fall down as we were coming from our train. She moved away then, back to the group. She reached down and picked up a shopping bag in each hand. She looked at Tayo one more time. He raised himself up on one arm and watched them go. He felt a current air from the movement of their skirts and feet and shopping bags. A child stared back at him, holding a hand, but walking twisted around so that he could see Tayo. The little boy was wearing an army hat that was too big for him, and when he saw Tayo looking, he smiled. Then the child disappeared through the wide de depot doors. The depot man helped him get up. He checked the tag on the suitcase. Should I call the veterans hospital? Tayo shook his head. He was, he was beginning to shiver all over. Those people, he said, pointing in the direction the women and children had gone. I thought they locked them up. Oh, that was some years back, right after Pearl Harbor. But now they've turned them all loose again. Send them home. I don't guess you could keep up with the news very well in the hospital. No, his voice sounded faint to him. You gonna be all right now? He nodded and looked down the tracks. The depot man had glanced at a gold pocket watch and walked away. The swelling was pushing against his throat and he leaned against the brick wall and vomited into the big garbage can. The smell of his own vomit and the rotting garbage filled his head and he retched until his stomach heaved in a frantic dry spasm. He could still see the face of that little boy looking back at him, smiling, and he tried to vomit that image from his head because it was Rocky's smiling face from a long time before when they were little kids together. He couldn't vomit anymore and the little face was still there. So he cried at how the world had come undone, how thousands of miles, high ocean waves, and green jungles could not hold people in their place. Years and months had become weak, and people could push against them and wander back and forth in time. Maybe it, always, maybe it had always been this way, and he was only seeing it for the first time. He sat on the bed with his back against the whitewashed wall and watched tiny crystals in the gypsum plaster as they glittered in the stream of sun from the window. He rocked. He relaxed now that the goats were loose and the yellow cat had her milk. As the sun went higher and left the eastern sky, the square of sunshine on the wall grew larger and diffused, and the bright yellow color of the early morning was gone. The tiny crystals disappeared gradually, the way stars did at dawn. He knew at some point the sunlight on the wall collapsed into his thoughts like pale gray cobwebs, clinging to all things within him, and then his stomach would begin to convulse and he would have to hold himself with both hands to try to hold back the tremor that grew inside him. He went outside before it happened. <clears throat> the wind was practicing with small gusts of hot air that flustered, that fluttered the leaves on the elm tree in the yard. The wind was warming up for the afternoon and within a few hours, the sky over the valley would be dense with red dust and along the ground the wind would catch waves of reddish sand and make them race across the dry red clay flats. The sky was hazy blue and it looked far away and uncertain, but he could remember times when he and Rocky had climbed Bone Mesa high above the valley southwest of Mesita, and he had felt that the sky was near and that he could have touched it. He believed then that the touching sky had to do with where you were standing and how the, cli and how the clouds were that day. He had believed that on certain nights when the moon rose full and wide as a corner of the sky, a person standing on the high sandstone cliff of that mesa could reach the moon. Distances and days existed in themselves then. They all had a story. They were not barriers. If a person wanted to get to the moon, there was a way. It all depended on whether you knew the directions, exactly which way to go and what to do to get there. It depended on whether you knew the story of how others before you had gone. He had believed in the stories for a long time until the teachers at Indian school taught him not to believe in that kind of nonsense. But they had been wrong. Josiah had been there in the jungle. He had come. Tayo had watched him die and he had done nothing in the jungle to save him. Kyle was 
was sitting under the elm tree in the shade when Harley came riding back up on the black burrow. The burrow was veering hard to the right, attempting to turn around and go in the opposite direction. Harley had the rope reins of the hackamore pulled all the way to the left, so that the burrow's head had twisted around to the north, but the burrow's legs and body moved sideways and drifted toward the east. Harley had to stop the burrow every few hundred yards to correct their direction. He swatted the burrow across the rump with a black horsehair cord, the kind the old Mexicans used to braid. Dust from the burrow's hide flew up around Harley. Harley saw Tayo and he tried to guide the burrow to the tree, but it ignored the direction its head was aimed and walked sideways to the water trough and it stopped. It stood there with its head up and a haughty look in its eyes. It waited until Harley was under the elm tree before it tasted the water. That burrow sure hates you, Harley. Harley laughed. Nobody ever rode it before, except maybe some of the kids when my dad had it over at Casablanca. Does it buff? It tries, but I think I'm too heavy for it. It doesn't jump very high. Harley was big and stocky. My legs almost touched the ground anyway. Tayo smiled again. His mouth felt stiff at the corners. Harley had been at Wake Island with Leroy, Valdez, and Emo. They had all come back with Purple Hearts, but it didn't seem as if the war had changed Harley. He was still a little fat, and he still made them laugh, joking and clowning. Hey, you don't happen to have a beer, do you? Tayo shook his head. There's some coffee on the stove. No, they say, ca they say coffee is bad for you, he laughed. And Tayo smiled because Harley didn't used to like beer at all. And maybe this was something that was different about him now after the war. He drank a lot of beer now, but Tayo could remember that time in the eighth grade where they had followed old Benny to see where he kept his wine. They watched him wave unsteadily through the salt brush down to the river willows and tamaracks, rowing along the river all the while clutching his brown shopping bag close to his chest. They watched him take one last taste of the wine and push the cork in tight before he put it back in the bag. And carefully, they get into the sandy riverbank, pushing white sand around the bag tenderly. They crouched with their chins on the sand and fallen willow leaves peeking through the willows at him as he took a last look, as if to memorize the hiding place. And then he walked crookedly up the hill, away from the river. They got to their feet then, and when Benny disappeared over the hill, they ran to the hiding place, where the river flowed into a quiet pool. Rocky and Tayo took the bottle of wine because there was only one bottle of beer. Okay for you, Harley, Rocky said. Beer tastes awful. Aw, oh, you don't know. You never tasted any, Harley answered, trying to pry off the bottle cap with the short blade of his pocket knife. He's right, Harley. Josiah let us taste some one time. The wine was sweet and sticky, a little like cough syrup, but they... Uh. But they drank it anyway because they had to if they wanted to get drunk. Harley finally got the beer open and he was anxious to catch up with them, so he took a big swallow. He made a terrible face, wrinkling up his nose and rolling his eyes. He spent the rest of the afternoon spitting in the river and they had to keep laughing because he kept saying, Oh, it's awful. It tastes like poison. And then he would spit again and try to wipe the inside of his mouth on the sleeve of his shirt. Harley squatted down beside Tayo. He traced little figures in the dirt by his feet. Tayo closed his eyes and leaned back against the bottom of the tree. He flexed his feet out in front of him. They were quiet for a while. The wind was getting stronger. It made a whirling sound as it came around the southwest corner of the ranch house. A piece of old tin on the roof of the shed began to rattle. Tayo felt as if he could sleep and maybe make up for them that night before. There was a peaceful silence beneath the sounds of the wind. It was a silence with no trace of people. It was the silence of hard dry clay and old juniper wood bleached white. But Harley was restless. Tayo could feel it. Harley kept whipping away the outlines he drew in the dirt and starting over again, angry that he couldn't draw them the way he wanted them. Tayo brought his knees up in front of him and concentrated on staying awake. Harley grinned at him. We got it easy, huh? All the livestock down at Montano 
and nothing for us war heroes to do but lay around and sleep all day? He reached over and poked Tayo gently in the ribs when he said, war heroes. I tried to go down there and help out, you know, when they first decided to move all the cattle and sheep down there. That was when you were, were still sick, Carly shook his head. Really, man, I tried to help. I told my old man, hey, let me do it. I promise I won't mess up. Honest. Carly was drawing an intricate pattern in the dirt, moving his forefinger without pausing him. But you know what happened? So they don't want me down there anymore. They told me I could look after the ranch out here like you. Carly looked up quickly to see Tayo's face. You know what I mean, Tayo? He said quickly. You were really sick when you got back, and there isn't a dang thing wrong with you. Tayo nodded, but he was thinking about what happened while Harley was at the Montano herding sheep, and he wasn't sure if Harley was right. The Montano had not been hard hit by the drought, so people with cattle and sheep moved them from the areas of the reservation which had no grass or water to the Montano, where they would keep them until the rains came, or for as long as the grass held out. Harley had come to the herd sheep for for his family. They pitched a small square camp tent for him and brought him supplies and fresh things to eat every two or three days. He had a sheepdog to help animals and a horse to ride all day long behind the grazing animals. His family was happy that he wanted to do this because it had taken Harley a while to settle down after he got home from the war. He had done a lot of drinking and raising stuff with Emo and some of the other veterans. But after a week down there, Harley left the sheep grazing with only the sheep dog to watch them. And he rode the horse over to the highway. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed. But that's going to be the end of uh, this part. Because I didn't realize there weren't actually chapters.